open up your Bibles. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 2 today. And to start, I just want you to know I have, I have really good news for you today. And it's this. It is that in this life, and you'll have, to, you'll have to let me finish because this won't seem like good news. In this life, we will all face circumstances. We will face situations that are unexpected, sometimes difficult, and very often completely outside of any aspect of control that we can take care of. But why is that good news? It's good news because God allows for us to face those situations so that we can experience and tell others about his faithfulness, about his goodness, about his power, about his sovereignty over all that goes on in this world. He wants us to know that when we are broken, when we are weak, when we are struggling, there is an answer, and it is to fully rely on him. Now today as we examine Daniel, we're going to see what is quite possibly the most perfect, I, I, I hesitate to use that word, but almost the perfect Christian response to an impossible situation. In approach, attitude, and action, Daniel is going to show us what it looks like to live out our faith effectively, especially when it looks like there's no hope and there's no answer for what's going on. And in that, God is also going to show us his ultimate power. So the king has a dream, and he wants answers. Now, if you don't know what that dream is, there's a statue. He sees this statue, and it's made up of different metals. The head is gold, the chest and arms are silver, silver the middle portions are bronze, the legs are iron, and the feet are iron mixed with clay. As he continues to observe the statue, a rock, and it says, uncut by human hands, essentially obliterates the whole thing. And then out of that grows a giant mountain. All that he saw humbled and frightened him, as it should have, and God was allowing him to come face to face with a future that was not under his control. Now, as we walk through the meaning of the dream, and this is actually the historical part of this dream, the, the, the factual part of this dream, we're going to see, and this is, this is not uh, my words when I describe this this way, but we're going to see that as the statue moves from head to foot, that as each section gains strength, as each one of those uh, civilizations is stronger than the one that it conquers, essentially it loses glory as it descends. So glory in the sense of high renown or honor won through notable achievements. Now, it's not that these civilizations did not have achievements, but that is going to decrease as the strength increases. Now, Babylon is the head of gold. That's the first, that's the first um, kingdom that is ruling here, and that's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. It was the most glorious of all the kingdoms, but he's finding out, as we are here, that it's not going to last. It's followed by the Medo Persia Empire. That's the chest made of silver. And again, more power, less glory. Greece is the stomach and thighs of bronze. And then Rome is represented by two things it's represented by iron to show that initially it is strong and it is stronger than anything else. But as you notice, the feet then are mixed with clay. And what that represents is the fact that while Rome starts strong, they end up having a lot of problems. There is not unity in this, and they are, they are weakened by social unrest, and the entire thing comes apart. Now, that gets us to verse 44. So let's read that together. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Now, obviously, if you're the king here, 
that doesn't seem like good news, especially when it has to somehow include you because that statue is of him. Now these kingdoms, although distinct from each other, represent, and don't get scared when I use this term, one world system. Yeah, Doug, don't. Okay, that, the, that, that's a kind of term that gets thrown around a lot, okay, but, but what we need to know is this. These kingdoms are a world system, one world system, and what I mean by that is the civilization with the most strength tries to come in and take over, but really, this is just a continuance of mankind. And then the stone comes and smashes all of it. That would be Christ and the kingdom of God. In other words, ruled by Jesus, it will destroy all that mankind has put together. The arrogance of man will be erased. All the combined glory and strength of humanity is unable to stand before the kingdom of God. There is no comparison. It is not simply that the kingdom of God is the strongest. It is there is no equal. God's kingdom is here. The rest is just pretty much garbage over here. Okay, there's no, no relatable uh, scale of strength there. Now, Daniel's goal here in writing this down was to share with the Jewish people what God was able to do. His sovereignty and his control over everything was what he wanted them to see. In other words, their exile is not going to last forever. And that's the part that gives us hope in this message. Yes, we are going to face difficulty. We are going to face circumstances that don't always look good. We are going to face inflation. We are going to face a pandemic. We are going to face a world right now that really looks pretty flipped upside down. And yet, God is in control. But when it comes to why this matters this morning, it actually goes deeper than that. And scripture, as we will see, provides us with Daniel's example in the midst of this chaos. And his example is prayer followed by praise. And that's what we're going to examine this morning. So, First, let's look at the circumstances. Why was this impossible? And the thing is, it's actually, in a sense, it's, it's pretty comical. Because what the king is actually doing here is realizing that all these men that he has working for him, all the magicians, are not that at all. There is no magic involved. They don't know what they're doing. And they're just guessing all the time. And that's why, if you notice, what they say to him is, well, why don't you tell us the dream, and then we'll interpret it. And he says, no, I want you to tell me what I dreamt, and then I want you to give me an interpretation. And their response is, but why don't you tell us the dream first, and then we'll figure it out. And what he's seeing here is that they don't know anything. They can't possibly know that he, they can't possibly know what he had dreamt. Now, the issue is that that's not how Babylonian culture worked. The way that this system worked was that the king would tell his magic advisors what was going on and then ask them to give their thoughts. But here, he's doing something very different. And they don't know what to do with it. They fail. They aren't magic. It made the, imp the request impossible. Now, Daniel will go on to describe how God enters the world of humanity to rescue people. And why that matters is because these guys think of God and humanity as completely separate. The gods and humanity have nothing to do with one another. They're never in contact with one another. And that's kind of where they're coming as far as trying to say, we can't figure this out. God has nothing to do with this. Now, every story told from this point forward in Daniel demonstrates how God interacts with the world. And the second half of this book is going to describe this in much more detail, and we're going to get to that later, but we're not quite there yet. Now, their pleas to the king are to no avail. He's angry. He says they all need to be put to death. That includes the men who are not there. So that's how Daniel and his friends are now included. 
And yet, this apparent crisis is divinely orchestrated by God himself. It creates an impossible situation through which God's plan for the world will be revealed. Now, one other interesting point here that I think is something that we don't think about a lot, but incredibly important. And that is that starting with the fourth verse of chapter 2, this scripture actually takes a turn. It is written in Aramaic rather than in Hebrew. And you might be wondering why that matters. And the reasoning is it really does come down to another wrinkle in God's plan, in his perfect plan. Because what this does is it means that because it's in Aramaic, it is not just for the Jewish people, it is for all people. The Gentiles are now included in being able to understand this and see what it means and gain that knowledge. And again, for a long time, people weren't quite sure why that was and what that meant. And as they've studied it and scholars have gone over this and over this and over this, what they are realizing is that this is another way in which God opens up his word to as many people as possible. So now we need to talk about the response. They know that there's nothing they can do. The king is angry. He says he's going to kill everyone because they won't do what he wants, and they can't do what he wants. And so Daniel now has a choice. What's he going to do? How does he take this impossible situation and then figure out a plan? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't always do what he does here. A lot of times I go home and I panic first and I make my wife deal with my panic and then and then she says well have you prayed about it and I'm like well I'm going to and then and then we you know we go through that thing right and the thing is is that it's it's frustrating I know that frustrates her and just so you know she does it to me too so I get frustrated with her but we do that to each other a lot and, and I don't mean just Heidi and I. I mean, we all do it. We all have friends. We all have family. Those of us who are married, it, it's like it's our habit to take a situation that seems like there's no answer and try to figure it out first and then later bring God into the equation. And the situation doesn't get fixed when we do that. What happens is we kind of tend to inflate all of our feelings and then we have to sort of calm down, we have to reset, and then we say, okay, Lord, I probably should have come to you first, right? But here's the thing. Daniel doesn't do that. So as out of control as the king is here, he remains calm. The word tells us he was intelligent, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve. And the thing is, he continued to learn and see what God was doing because he had done this in chapter 1. When the diet situation happens, he knows that that official that is talking to him is in real trouble. That if he continues on with his um, attempt to not do what the king was saying, that that official could be in real trouble. And yet God gave him favor and compassion in dealing with him, and he took it and he ran with it. So he would do the same with Daniel as he deals with the official now in chapter 2. Through that, Daniel responds with tact and discretion. That's what the word tells us. He is God-honoring in his response, even as the chaos of death is swirling around him. Now, I already actually kind of touched on this in the pastoral prayer, but this is a quote by... Um, a pastor is by the name of D. Duke, and he says this, almost everyone believes that prayer is important. Now, I think that's probably true. I think almost everyone in this room can say that they realize that prayer is, is important. It's, it's an aspect of our spiritual life. Yes, we need to do it. It's important. But he goes on. There is a difference between believing that prayer is important and believing it is essential. Essential means there are things that will not happen without prayer. Now, I don't know about you, that is a burden I want to take on. I want to know that I am praying about things and things are happening because I am honoring the Lord in my communication with him. 
Daniel's life is at stake along with his friends and many others. And in the, in the midst of these impossible circumstances, he gives us the perfect response. He prays, he rests, and he praises. Now, that might seem, that middle part might not seem like a big deal. But think about that for a second. Think about facing something that you know is a chaotic emergency of some sort. And think about in the middle of that, being able to simply go to sleep. Being able to simply take a moment and rest. The only reason and the only way that is possible is because he went to the Lord first. He laid it at his feet, he gave everything over to him, and then was able to calmly rest. And when he wakes up, he's going to then give all glory and honor back to the Lord. Amos 3, 7. Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. Daniel believed that. Daniel believed that and he lived that. It's exactly why he returned home, he calmly discussed the circumstances, and then he prayed with his friends. Now again, notice the difference there. He didn't go home, he didn't panic, he didn't say, you're not going to believe this, and then lose his mind. He went home, he said, this is what's going on, we need to pray. And then it goes even further. They didn't only pray for themselves, they prayed for the lives of all of those Babylonian men, the advisors who don't know anything, the advisors that were not on the same team as them, the advisors who were essentially just fakes paid by the king. And he said, we're going to pray for them as well. He is living out Mark 12, 30 and 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. We are even seeing here as Daniel is dealing with this situation that he is putting the Lord first and then he doesn't forget his neighbor. And honestly, that stands out to me because I think this is probably one of those moments where if he hadn't thought about his neighbor, it wouldn't have really mattered. Because God's going to do what he wants to do. God's going to take care of things. Those men don't mean anything to him in terms of, you know, they're, they're not a cohesive unit. As we will find in chapter 6, most definitely. Those men are, in many cases, his enemies. And yet... He prays for them as well because he is putting his neighbor above himself. He allows for the peace of God to rule over him. Now, how do we know that? Again, he goes to sleep. There's only one way for that to be possible, and it's because he lets the Lord take over and rule in his heart in such a way that he's able to rest. He cannot control what is going on. In fact, at this point, he really doesn't even know what God's going to do. And then he sleeps, and God comes to him and tells him exactly what the dream means. He answers his prayer. And Daniel does, again, almost sometimes I think what is the opposite of what our normal human response to this is. A lot of times, I don't know about you, again, I, if I was dealing with a dream, I feel like I would be waking up, I would be running to get everything taken care of, and that my first thing would be, I've got to get this taken care of. I've got to get to the king. I've got to make sure he knows what this means. And instead, what Daniel does is he wakes up and he says, I am going to praise your name first. Because you are the one who has done this. Not me. This is not my own knowledge. This is knowledge granted to me from you as an answer to my prayer. In doing so, he is acknowledging God's sovereignty over all. He is thanking him for the gift of revelation that can only come from him. Now, interpreting the dream was important. Daniel knows that. But knowing and worshiping God was his ultimate goal. Now, it's a rich song of praise as we go into what Daniel then responds with. To God. 
He acknowledges the following aspects of his, characters, of his character and activity. The first is his eternality. He was and is and always will be. He then acknowledges his omniscience, he knows all, his omnipotence, he's all powerful, his sovereignty over the nations, he has supreme authority, his gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, in other words, he reveals things to his people, his faithfulness to his people, he can be trusted and he is loyal, and lastly, simply for answering Daniel's prayer. He acknowledges that he serves a God who listens to and answers his children. His example is one to follow because through everything he faces, no matter how difficult, he asks the Lord for things and then he gives all credit to God himself. It is quite the example. Now the thing is, is that last week we kind of focused a little bit more on integrity. And this week, we're talking a little bit about how God honors a response that honors him. How God takes a response that honors him in the face of adversity and then does something with it. So what does that have to do with an unshakable kingdom? Now, obviously the dream is sort of where that title comes from because we know that we see all of this power and, and ruling authority of mankind and then all of a sudden it's wiped out. It means nothing because God's kingdom is a kingdom in itself. But more than that, when we are facing these things, when we are facing whatever it is that seems like we don't have an answer, when we are facing whatever it seems like is confusing, it doesn't make sense, we don't know how to proceed in any way, shape, or form. It is when in those situations that we can trust and obey that God's power and faithfulness will not only be shown, they will overwhelm us in ways we cannot even imagine until we're there. My prayer for you today is that as those things happen, just as songsters sang, when the shadows fall, we are not alone. We serve a faithful God who is listening and he wants us to simply be able to take everything that life throws at us, lay it at his feet, and trust him. And if we can do that, he is going to provide us not only with the answers that we need. Now, I will say this before I go on. I'm not saying this is easy. And I'm not saying that some of the circumstances that we face are not difficult sometimes is not even the word. There are things we are going to face where we don't know how we're going to get up tomorrow. And I am not in any way minimizing that. But what I am saying to you is that specifically in those kind of situations, when it's as dire as it possibly could be, let the Lord work and rule in your life. Let him show his faithfulness to you. Let him be shown to other people because they see how you react to adversity. If you are able to take a situation that seems like there's no answer and remain calm and remain faithful and remain in a situation where you are obeying and trusting the Lord, it has a profound effect on the people around you who are not able or used to doing that. That panic response is pretty normal for most people. And when we don't do that, because we are letting the Lord lead, it brings people in, to a point in their life where they have to say, I don't know how that person does that and I've got to figure it out. Now my hope is that when things like that are happening, we've already talked to them about what it means to be in a relationship with the Lord. And yet if not, what a perfect time to be able to do it. To explain that when life throws things that we are not expecting at us, that we serve a God who is faithful 
and who is the supreme authority in this world and has a perfect plan for our lives, and we are going to trust and obey him in all ways possible. When the trials come, we will not walk alone. When life seems impossible, God's ultimate power and greatness will be on display. Again, it's a difficult thing to try to process that God allows things to happen in our life that are painful. And yet it's not that he wants us to experience pain. It's that he wants the people in this world to be able to see who he is as we deal with difficulty. He wants his message of love to be shown to the world because we are able to live out what it means to be faithful followers of Christ. Now, you might be facing difficulty today. You may have just walked through a difficult situation. You may have something on the horizon that you're not even aware of yet. My hope from today is that you will see how Daniel does this. You will see how Daniel handles this. And why it's important and why it matters is because his example shows us that it is possible to be in the midst of the fire and to simply trust and let the Lord lead. And God will honor that behavior in us. He will honor the fact that we are taking something and instead of trying to just kind of grip our hands around it and not let go and try to come up with answers on our own, he will take our efforts in coming to him and he will be faithful in that. I don't always know what his timing is going to be and neither do you. But I can tell you that whatever the timing is, God's faithfulness endures. His love for us endures. His authority in this world endures. We serve a living and powerful God. Now for that reason, the praise band's gonna come up and we are gonna close. And we're gonna close um, on, on a high today but we're gonna do it in this way, in anticipation of what God has in store. Not only for us as individuals, but for this place as a whole. We're gonna sing about God's greatness. And it might seem simple, and it is. It is pretty simple. And yet what I want you to remember as we sing these words, as we, as we lift this praise to the Lord, is that what we are doing this morning, what we are doing right now in this moment, is we are saying to the Lord, whatever comes tomorrow, whatever happens, you are great. Whatever happens, I love you. Whatever happens, I want to trust, I want to obey, I want to be faithful to you. And I'm gonna, my wife's not here today, so I can kind of do what I want and she'll find out later. But, <laughs> She's, she's preaching on Daniel 3 next week. And the only reason that I think I can actually get away with this without really getting in trouble is that it is actually the verse that's on our bulletin. Even though I know she's going to be talking a lot about it next week. But it's my favorite verse in the Bible. Because they are about to go into the furnace and what they say is our God will protect us. And then they add but even if he does not, we will not serve you. And today, God is faithful to us. We need answers sometimes. And even if they don't seem to come, his faithfulness endures forever. His strength endures forever. His authority and power in this world endure forever forever. So knowing that and knowing what he is going to do in our lives, even if we don't know what that looks like yet, I want to sing today and I want to praise him. We want to praise him for his faithfulness, for the faithfulness that has already taken place and the faithfulness that will continue and take place in the future. So as we sing, um, I'm going to hand over to them. But I ask that you would sing these words, simple words, 
and do so in great anticipation of what it is the Lord is going to do.